Hello, everyone. Welcome. Today, in this interview, we are going to talk how sanctions imposed by the U.S. and by the European countries can affect the target economies and how those sanctions affect uh, multinational companies, government, and millions of people around the world. So today, I'm talking with Agathe de Mahé. She is the Global Forecasting Director at the Economist Intelligence Unit. She's also the author of of Backfire, a book discussing the global rip effects of U.S. sanctions and the steps that targeted countries are taking to insulate themselves from U.S. penalties. As foreign journalists, correspondents, covering those topics in different parts of the world. I believe we have a lot uh, to learn from Agathe uh, here in this interview. I'm Patricia Vasconcelos, a board member of the association and a U.S. correspondent for SBT Brazilian TV Network. Agathe, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, for sharing your thoughts. And so we have the opportunity to talk about your book, Backfire. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Exactly. I also would like to note that Agat also worked as an economic advisor for the diplomatic corps of the French Treasury with postings in Russia and Middle East. She worked in investment banking in Russia and the US. She has a master's degree from Sciences Pro uh, Po Paris and Columbia University, where she is studied as a Fulbright scholar. She speaks fluent French, English, Russian, Arab, and Spanish. So Agat, about your book right that uh we are going uh we had this release in november 15th and it talk uh, about this topic uh which is so much important nowadays and as we foreign journalists we are covering i can say uh in a daily basis um my first question is which message uh do you think sanctions are sending to the west well essentially sanctions feel avoided they fill a void between diplomatic declarations on the one hand and military interventions on the other hand of the spectrum. And mm -hmm. so sanctions really fill this void and then they send a message of resolve to the targeted country. So for instance, in Russia's case, because Russia is all over the news at the moment, well, sanctions send a message of resolve and of unity because we've seen quite a lot of unity between Europe and America when it comes to sanctions. So it's it's really an important diplomatic message. And actually, Vladimir Putin probably wasn't expecting that there would be such huge transatlantic collaboration and unity on sanctions against Russia. From your perspective, is it an efficient uh, diplomatic message? Well, essentially, it'd be, the, the key question is efficient to do what? And that's a key point, actually, because sanctions, well, recent sanctions, oftentimes we do not exactly know the objectives of sanctions. This is something that I discuss in the book, and that is particularly important for policymakers, especially in the US, because sanctions have become such an important weapon in the arsenal of US diplomats. But for many targeted countries, sometimes the goals of the US aren't very clear. And this is very clear in the case of Russia these days. So of course, the US and Western countries are responding to Russia's brutal aggression against Ukraine. But what would it take? What would Russia need to do for sanctions to be lifted? This is a key question. And so if we measure the effectiveness of sanctions, then first we need to define these objectives. Mm -hmm. That being said, we can see that there are probably three objectives of recent sanctions against Russia. But again, that is my analysis or the analysis of people who follow sanctions, these haven't been clearly indicated. Mm -hmm. The first message is exactly what we discussed a few minutes ago. It's a message of diplomatic resolve, of unity of Western countries to, well, stand with Ukraine against Russian aggression. The second objective of sanctions is probably to make it harder for Russia to wage war in Ukraine financially because, well, the Russian economy, because of sanctions, is going to register a recession this year. So it will put the Russian economy in a difficult position. And also from the technological perspective, because recent sanctions on Russia restrict the export of semiconductors to Russia. And this is a key problem because Russian missiles are full of Western-made semiconductors. And finally, the third message, but this one will take a lot of time to actually to bear fruit, 
it is a message and it is an objective it is to asphyxiate the russian economy as i discuss in the book since 2014 the us has imposed restrictions stringent restrictions on the russian energy sector restrictions for financing and for accessing the technology for the energy sector and this is a key problem because a number of russian energy fields are coming to what is called maturity the reserves are fast depleting so russia needs to explore and develop new oil and gas fields but without western financing and without western technology this will be very difficult and so we're really talking at a slow asphyxiation of the russian energy sector here because of sanctions but it will take a lot of time yeah, definitely. It seems that um, sanctions, um, they are reshaping relations between countries, right? And uh, pushing governments that are odds with the US closer to each other, or increasingly, it seems like uh, you talk about this uh, in your book to, uh, to other countries like Russia and China. And more recently, uh, we saw news from North Korea, United States saying that North Korea is providing um, military equipment um to Moscow to Russia in order to help them with the invasion in Ukraine um what is going to be the limit for that for that um is is and is this all related do you believe uh to sanctions are shank- sanctions uh, provoking this somehow yes exactly it's a bit like antibiotics if you allow me to make this analogy Antibiotics are extremely important, and so are sanctions. They're a very important diplomatic tool for Western countries to put pressure on rogue countries or on US enemies. But if you use antibiotics too much, then you have resistance. And the same can be said about sanctions, because over the past decades, there has been probably an overuse of sanctions. And so targeted countries are increasingly building mechanisms to circumvent sanctions, to insulate their economies from sanctions. Mm -hmm. And given that sanctions rely on financial channels, these tools unsurprisingly focus on financial technology. And we can mention three, for instance. And these are tools that are increasingly used by Russia and China, which are the two arch enemies of the US. Mm -hmm. The first tool is what is called bilateral currency swaps. It's a bit of an obscure term, but what it means is that countries can do trade with each other without using the US dollar. Usually they would use the US dollar for bilateral trade, but with these swaps, they can trade with each other, for instance, in renminbi or in ruble directly. Mm -hmm. And this insulates, in part, their trade from US sanctions. So this is the first tool. It's also called de-dollarization. The second tool is digital currencies. This is a very interesting development. It's actually led by China. 300 million Chinese people currently use a digital renminbi. And this is very important. It's stored on the mobile phones of Chinese citizens, and it's used to do daily operations. And sanctions would have strictly no effects on a digital currency that is issued by the central bank of another country, in this case, the People's Bank of the Republic of China. Mm-hmm. Um, and finally, the third tool is alternatives to SWIFT. SWIFT is some sort of a Rolodex of global banking institutions. And SWIFT connects all banks with each other. But if you use SWIFT, well, there is some Western supervision, some oversight over SWIFT. Mm-hmm. And A number of countries, led by China again, are building alternative tools to SWIFT. And in China, it's called SIPS. And this alternative is actually growing. It's still very small, but there is no point for Russia and China in having the biggest tool, the biggest alternative to SWIFT. Their point is to have a viable plan B to SWIFT, and they increasingly have it. And so the combination of these tools taken together will increasingly dent, weaken the effectiveness of U.S. sanctions. And this is a key challenge for U.S. policymakers, because if in a decade the U.S. doesn't have sanctions anymore, if sanctions become ineffective, Mm -hmm. then I was saying a few minutes ago, sanctions fill the void between diplomatic declarations and war. And so if this void is empty, that will be a tremendous challenge for U.S. policy. Mm-hmm. A lot has been said here and also in your book about China. What is the main support worldwide, you believe, uh, for Moscow with all that is happening um, 
things so, are changing day by day and and uh, very quickly i know but um now we are in november 2022 so um where does it come the main um support you believe so there are two pockets of support that I believe are very interesting to take a look at. The first one is China. China is the big question, uh, big question mark, because obviously China has been treading a fine line without overtly supporting Russia, but at the same time, it is Russia's lifeline. And it is the only country that Russia will be able to turn to, notably to export gas, because Russia has turned off the gas tap to Europe. Mm -hmm. And so to export gas, the only alternative for Russia will be to turn to China. So it will be very interesting to see if China does buy more Russian gas or not, because so far there is no infrastructure or limited infrastructure in terms of gas pipelines for Russia to export its gas to China. And so it will be very interesting to see if this happens. But so far, support, I mean, real meaningful support beyond declarations has been limited. We haven't seen, for instance, Chinese companies invest in the, in the Russian market in droves. And this reflects two things. The fact, A, that Russia is in a recession, and B, that Chinese firms are very worried about falling full of US sanctions. So that's the first thing. That's the China question. We don't have an answer, but interesting one to take a look at. And the second one is emerging countries. And these will re be really up for grabs for Russia and China on the one hand and Western countries on the other hand. What's happening is that we've seen a gradual withdrawal of Western countries from emerging states, notably, for instance, in Africa for European countries. And Russia and China are trying to, well, make up for that to come to these countries and to offer financing, for instance, through the Belt and Road Initiative or to offer vaccines, as we saw during the coronavirus pandemic, or to offer grains, because what's happening at the moment is that Russia has blocked some grains chip shipments from Ukraine, and it has claimed that the shipments were blocked because of sanctions, which was not true. And at the same time, it has offered to give grains directly to emerging countries. So this is a very interesting, actually, narrative because Russia seeks to do two things. The first one is that it seeks to fuel divisions and to sow resentment in emerging states against developed countries by saying sanctions are responsible for food insecurity, which is not the case. And second, Russia is trying to make head gains in emerging states to advance its interests. So I would say two types of pockets of support, China on the one hand, and then emerging markets on the other hand will be very interesting to watch. Emerging markets. And um, with everything that is happening, do you see any change um, uh, coming from uh, Moscow or sanctions and other type of initiatives that are coming from the United States and other and also Europe? Um, is this uh, effective? Is this solving the problem? Or you don't see um, Vladimir Putin changing his mind um, anyway? So I think it's very different to isolate the effect of sanctions from everything else that is happening at the moment. It's very hard to pinpoint and say sanctions will be responsible for Vladimir Putin doing this and that. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that to assess the effectiveness of sanctions is also very hard because we do not have the counter narrative. We do not know what would have happened if sanctions had not been put into place. What I mean by that is that no one knows what Putin would have done if sanctions hadn't been imposed by the US and the European Union. Then to answer your question about Putin's calculus, well, the first thing we need to say, we need to be very humble here because no one knows what he thinks. Maybe a few people around him do, but the rest of us, no one knows. But what is really clear is that sanctions will gradually take their toll on the Russian economy. And as such, they are trying to signal to the Russian leadership that mm -hmm. continuing the war in Ukraine is a folly that it is going to lead to this slow asphyxiation of the Russian economy that I was discussing um, a few minutes ago. But then to see whether it will lead to a change uh, in Putin's calculus, well, that's very, very hard to say. We would need a crystal ball for that. But it's at least part of the tools that Western countries have to pressure Russia to change course and to make it harder for Russia to wage war financially and technologically against Ukraine. Mm -hmm. You also argue, uh, Agit, 
uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, go the, the golden days of sanctions are over. Could you explain very briefly that? Yes, exactly. That's um, one of the arguments that I make in the book. In my view, the golden days of U.S. unilateral sanctions are over because of the development of the financial mechanisms that I have discussed a few minutes ago. It's about this sanctions resistance, like antibiotics resistance movement that I was mentioning a few minutes ago. And what this means, if targeted countries like Russia, like China, like Iran, like Venezuela or North Korea, if they they make their economies immune to U.S. sanctions. Well, this is a very, very dangerous development for U.S. diplomacy because it will mean that the U.S. has fewer tools to advance its interests globally. And so what is the solution to that? A potential solution is multilateral sanctions because these are far harder for targeted countries to circumvent because multilateral sanctions are imposed by every country around the world. And so this is far harder to actually get around when you're a targeted country. These are the types of sanctions that are in place, for instance, against North Korea under the aegis of the UN, the United Nations. Uh -huh. But multilateral sanctions are hard to draft because you need to have the agreement of all the countries around the table and at the moment, they're not an option against Russia because Russia and China are permanent members of the UN Security Council. Exactly. But in the future, maybe multilateral sanctions will be the only option for the US. And I'm talking in a few decades, maybe one decade, two decades, 2030, decades. 2040. Wow. Yes, it's a real long term threat, I would say, um, which makes it actually harder to grasp for US policymakers. You know, when something happens very slowly, it's sometimes hard to grasp the threat. But it's, it's to me, in my mind, and that's what I argue um, in Backfire, it's a real threat to US diplomacy and, and one that needs to be tackled. Mm -hmm. So a lot of topics to, to talk about. And I am sure that we, as I said at the beginning, as foreign journalists, we have a lot um, to learn from you and uh, your thoughts. So Aga, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to also invite everyone to read the book if they didn't. Uh, Backfire, right? Uh, available starting now in November 15th. So thank you very much. This interview is going to be available soon in our website. Thank you very much. I spoke here today with Agat De Mahé, the Global Forecasting Director at the Economist Intelligent Unit. She's the author of Backfire, uh, this book which discussed the global rip effects of the U.S. sanctions and the steps that target countries are taking to insulate themselves from U.S. penalties. Thank you very much. Have a great day, Agat. Thank you so much.